nonpartisan, nonpolitical organization. We receive no financial support from cities, counties, states, or federal government, or the military. We are funded solely by the donations from our membership and from civilians. We support the men and women serving our country and their families. We support youth programs. And we educate the public about the needs of a maritime nation, both on the public level, our business leaders, and our elected officials. The Navy League is currently rolling out a series of community service organization presentations to reach the average American. The series includes one each for the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Marine Corps, the Flag Merchant Marine, and Joint Forces to provide information that the man and woman on the street does not hear on the radio, does not read in the newspaper, and does not see on television. When our, the public understands what our active duty and reserve men and women do and how it relates to their personal lives, our countrymen are better prepared to make decisions. Today we are honored and pleased to provide an opportunity for Venturans and Santa Barbarans to hear from the Chief of Naval Personnel, Vice Admiral Mark Ferguson. Uh, it's my pleasure, it's my pleasure to be here today. And it's a great pleasure to talk about something that I love, which is the United States Navy. And more importantly, the people of the United States Navy. Today, serving around the globe are over 330,000 active duty, 65,000 reserves um, that span from anti piracy patrols off the Horn of Africa to maritime security operations off the east coast of Africa in the Gulf of Guinea to counter narcotics operations uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and down into the Pacific shores of South America. It was my privilege last week to visit the oil skimming teams. We've deployed every piece of equipment from here at Port Miami and around the country to Gulfport, Mississippi to deploy and to assist with this ecological crisis that we have taking place in the Gulf of Mexico. And there are sailors down there working with that equipment today, uh, CBs and others and engineers do that. Um, we have submarines that recently broke through the polar ice and operate up there. And, and those of you may have read that, that uh, we had a cruiser last year off the coast of Hawaii that shot down a satellite with an Aegis weapon system. It's a Navy that's forward deployed. It's a Navy that's global. It's a Navy that um, also recognizes that all our security challenges are not just those that require force. When the earthquake happened in Haiti, the Navy deployed the hospital ship Comfort within about 10 days with over 900 medical people on board. It was the largest trauma response that we've generated in our history uh, down to Haiti, along with 12 other ships to provide that operation. So it's a Navy that, that uh, is busy every day. On a given day, 50% of our ships and operating units are underway at sea and, and uh, nearly 40% are deployed overseas, I mean away from home shores in training. So it's a very busy Navy, a very active one, and one that uh, is vital to our nation. And I say that because when I look at the globe from space and a picture of it, we could just as easily have called this planet ocean instead of Earth. 70% of it is covered by ocean. We are a maritime nation and our livelihood and our economy uh, comes from trade and flows over the great global common that is the sea. And, and the Navy as the safeguarder of that global common and the protector of those seas. Um, that is our mission and our challenge to ensure both our prosperity and our safety here at home. But what's really important to me is to come and say thank you. Thank you first to the Navy League. I know the Navy League's been involved in 13 commands and sponsored the Sockdale and, and the Ronald Reagan. Um, and so I'm personally grateful for all the support we've got from the Navy League. But to come to this facility and to look at the special covenant that the American people have with their veterans 
and particularly the state of California and Ventura County with their veterans. It's a very special day for me to come see this. Uh, it's been my opportunity to travel around the globe and to see other nations and their navies and visit with them. And nowhere, nowhere have I found a stronger commitment to veterans, to their care after their service, than I have found in the United States. And, and to me, it is a very sacred bond uh, that we should always safeguard and hold dear. Um, what I'd like to talk about is just talk to you a little bit about our sailors and just how amazing these young people are and, and what we're doing with them and the quality of them. We are sitting today with a group of sailors that is the highest quality we have ever had in our history. 97% uh, are high school graduates, the highest number we've had. Over 80% of them score in the upper half of our entry exams compared to all of those that take it. Um, we have given no waivers. It used to be, you know, some of the veterans here reminded me that it was join the Navy or go to jail. In their day. <laughs> now, they, I won't tell you which one said that. But, uh, the, uh, but we've given no major waivers for folks to enter. People, young people are waiting nine months to come into the Navy right now and to join us. And they're joining us at, uh, with, with test scores and performance that far outstrips. I don't think I could compete and get into the Naval Academy today. And it's an amazing group of people. The Navy in its enlisted ranks is 48% diverse. It's an amazing change that's taking place in the Navy. And in our officer classes coming into Annapolis, where Rob and I started, um, I hate to admit it, back in the summer of 1974, uh, on a very hot July day when we started together, Rob was taller, so he got, to, he got to stand in the front, and so we had to stand behind him and follow him when we were marching. The, uh, um, the entry standards to get into Annapolis are extraordinarily high, but the entry class in Annapolis this year is 35% diverse, it's 20% women. And there's a, there's a tectonic shift happening in the demographics of the country. And you see that women are earning over half the college degrees in the United States. And you see that um, we've made changes, we've opened up submarine duty to women to serve first beginning this year. Uh, women are serving across the force in, in fighter jets and, and serving remarkably well. Um, but the shift in the diversity of the talent of the nation compels us to look at ourselves and to see how we can attract that magnificent talent and keep it for a career. Um, this generation that's entering is truly dedicated to service and they're unique in some ways, but they're so much like the greatest generation that served during World War II. They care about serving for something greater than themselves. They care about um, serving the nation. And what we're seeing is re-enlistment rates within the Navy of first tour sailors of in the mid-60s, you know, 61, 62 percent, to re-enlist after serving in the Navy for four or five years. That's a historical high for us. And second tour to 10-year point, it's up in the 70% range and even higher as they get more senior. And so why, you know, why do they stay with us? They stay with us because, first of all, I think because of the tremendous ethos of service for what we offer them and the ability to serve the nation, to be educated through tuition assistance and these other great programs, the remarkable benefits in the pay um, and compensation that's been so so taken care of by the Congress and others that, that help us. Um, but also things like the public-private housing ventures that you see here uh, in Ventura County that give them a, a, an amazing place to live, terrific health care, the stability and security of a job, the ability to serve the nation, and then knowing that when their service is done and they retire, that the nation is grateful and that the nation will take care of them. And it's, it's a remarkable time to serve with them. Um, on any given year, we bring in 40,000 young people into the Navy across the country. And they're, they're just amazing. And we have tried to capture this generation. You may have seen our new advertising campaign, but 
America's Navy a global force for good. And it really captures what we are in the sense of the humanitarian missions of the comfort that I talked about, the anti-piracy operations off Africa, as well as the side of our business that involves the use of force um, off aircraft carriers or submarines or surface ships. But this global force for good has resonated amazingly with this young generation. But this young generation is a little different in that they're looking for more. And those of you that are employers that see that in them, uh, I call them digital natives, not digital immigrants, like most of us. And they have a different outlook, and, and they view careers with looking for flexibility, looking for uh, options as they progress along, and we've tried to capture that in the Navy, so I'd like to talk about some of those things. And your Navy, in the last year, has won over 12 national awards for the way that we manage our, our sailors and employees and some of the opportunities. Let me talk about some of them, because I think they're instructive as to what we're trying to do in the future. We offer a sabbatical program for men and women to apply to take a couple years off from service in the Navy to care for an aging parent, to take care of a child issue, or even if one spouse wants to let the other go to school, we had a, a, a male officer take some time off so his wife could go to Yale Graduate School. And we pay them a small stipend, they still get health care, they still get commissary privileges, and then after the period of time they come back in and they don't lose any of their their uh, opportunity to get promoted at that point. So that's an amazing program. We're offering telework programs and virtual work programs around the country where officers don't have to move to Washington. And this was in response to the economic crisis where individuals got trapped in their homes and they couldn't sell them without a significant loss. And so I have officers that work for me that live in Whidbey Island up in off Seattle. I have individuals that work for me that are in Kings Bay, Georgia, because he's a captain and his son was in his senior year of high school. And so we're expanding these type of programs. Um, and they're remarkably attractive to this generation. We are looking at, um, and let me just comment, if you remember seeing the pictures from Washington, you all were probably looking with amusement at Snowmageddon when it happened <laughs> back in Washington when we had a foot of snow in a period of time. Many of my staff, because we had introduced telework and were working one day a week or so out of the house uh, and put the tools in place, we could continue to operate and do that. I was just down in, in Millington, Tennessee about two weeks ago where um, the community there, one of my commands with about a thousand people, was hit by a flash flood with those terrible tornadoes and rain in the Midwest. And so in the span of about two hours, we lost our entire computer network, our server farm, our Blackberries. Um, everything went down and people in their homes, it went from just a rainstorm to being up to their chest in less than two hours to be evacuated by boat. Um, but the amazing part to me is, and they responded magnificently, nobody was hurt, nobody got lost in this. But when the services went down, how do you think we reconstituted and told people where to get help and how to muster and where to get family services and food? We used Facebook and it worked. It was magnificent. So this, you know, this ability to reach out to people in this social networking media in this young generation um, is an opportunity for us to create a work environment that's a results-oriented work environment, to allow them to contribute, to balance their career aspirations with their family choice because it's a strategic imperative for us to retain this remarkable talent that we're bringing in to the Navy and to make ourselves an employer of choice so that people stay with us. We've offered innovative programs that have won awards like credentialing online where the Navy will pay for a sailor to get a credentialing opportunity in the private sector and we'll pay for the credentialing. So, you know, when I when we first started this, people would say, well, you're going to invest in people, they'll just leave. And, and what we're finding is these initiatives like telework, these initiatives focusing on life-work balance. We raised our operational deferment for new mothers in the Navy to be a year that you don't have to deploy, which is the longest of any of the services. 
And so it allows a new mother to get stable in her family, to bond with her child, and then we found our female retention went up. We found the loyalty among our sailors went up because we find that it's more than about money and a paycheck. It's about opportunity. It's about caring for a family. It's about providing people the ability to balance their work and their life. And this young generation craves that. And, and we're extraordinarily blessed with their service. And I think we owe that to them to take care of them. Um, the Congress just passed last year the uh, GI Bill. Senator Webb was the sponsor. But that's an amazing benefit that we're very grateful for in the sense that not only does it give a service member with three years of service the ability to go out and get a fully funded state college degree with a living stipend and a book stipend, but our sailors could transfer that to their spouses or to their children to pay for their college to go through school. We had over 15,000 sailors transfer that benefit to a child last year alone. But in doing that, they have to stay with us for 10 years in order to have that benefit. So this, this network of benefits is really, really important to us um, as we go forward to keep this greatest generation in service. So when I come to groups like the Navy League and, and, and facilities such as this, this really fits in to our vision of this complete support system that we have for our sailors and their families um, that are operating so much. On any given day in the United States Navy, we have about 4,000 sailors that are in limited duty of some sort. Um, we also have a program we call Safe Harbor. And Safe Harbor, um, we monitor our critically injured, uh, ill and wounded from both combat and non-combat injuries. Um, Think of those that are involved in serious car accidents or motorcycle accidents, for example. And we're finding that this non-medical case management is so vitally important to help people navigate through the systems of benefits and to help them navigate through that. We have about 500 that are in that program right now. But we don't just follow them while they're on active duty. We follow them through their lives. And we've committed to follow them all the way through to a system. And and so that group, that core group of about five or 600 sailors that we track that way, wounded seals in battle, um, others that have been seriously injured in combat, we're finding that it resonates through the rest of the Navy, that they look and they say, this is an organization that cares, this is an organization that will take care of me and my family, this will be the focus that I don't have to worry when I deploy and I go forward. That the team will take care of them. And that team includes the private citizens, organizations like the Navy League, and states like California that have these magnificent facilities that can care for them uh, afterwards. So uh, those are some stories about the people and the programs. Um, I guess I would close with, and, and just you know, in my way of saying thanks and talk about it, is that we recognize that um, the economy will get better, life will change, it will, it will come back. We're very hopeful of that, and our indicators are saying that. And so as we look to this future, um, and I'm sure there's some homeowners in here that would like it to come back. <laughs> I, I know I would. <laughs> and and as, as things go through their cycles and they come back, the constancy for me, as, as I look at these young people, is their great commitment to service, their great desire to wear the cloth of the nation and to think less of themselves and more of what they can do to benefit. It's an inspiration and it keeps me going on those days when, when we were fighting the budget battles in Washington or other events to, to realize that it's these magnificent young people that sustain us. And then when I come here to see all of you and to see that, that the community so supports the Navy uh, here where we have a great history here, both at Point Magoo and Port Wainimi. It, it's a very, very inspiring thing. And and at night sometimes in Washington, I'll, I'll wander down and I get vexed with problems and I'll need to think. I'll walk down to the Lincoln Memorial down on the mall and I'll go down there and I'll walk up those magnificent steps and and think about the problems that Lincoln had. And they're a mind seat minor in comparison. And I look on one side and it's written the Gettysburg Address 
face him to the left, and on the right is um, the words of his second inaugural. And, and, and as I look at these young people, it reinforces to me those, those closing words of the gay friend address the government of the people, for the people, and by the people shall never perish from the face of the earth. And, and I ask you to remember that because if anything from the study of Lincoln, as we go through trials, you can never lose faith. And, and these great young people, they're very inspiring, and they keep me from ever losing faith. Thank you very much for the opportunity to visit with you today. And very much lady who sang the national anthem and, and, and the prayer were just so magnificent. I just want to give a round of applause for both. Now's the time for question and answers. Does anyone have a question for the Admiral? Uh, uh, yes. Can you speculate if or when there's going to be another Barack? <laughs> oh, <okay>. um, <laughs> That's a great question. I, I would say that if you were to ask the services, um, there is there is uh, some belief that there is some excess capacity that exists, uh, and it will really depend on what the shape of the services take as we start to come down in Afghanistan and Iraq, and then what's the footprint that we need. There is no discussion that I know of taking place in the Congress or in the broader perspective to pass the law that would enable that. Um, and so I don't know of any prospects in the near term. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yes, sister. What sort of accommodations have you had to make to um, allow women to uh, join the forces on submarine service? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the first of all, I would say that the, we've selected our first 19 and they will be starting nuclear power training in about a month. Um, several came out of the Naval Academy, but they came from other universities as ROTC to start. Um, their records were absolutely extraordinary in grade point average and being in engineers and a great desire to do it. Um, the initial phase will be focused on ballistic missile submarines, which are based in Kings Bay, Georgia, or uh, up in the Seattle area. And they will be assigned as officers initially, and they will be placed in two-person staterooms, and the, the ballistic missile submarine has that ability to have staterooms for the women because it's a much larger submarine with room in it. And so we're going to do that initially. Uh, they will get, you know, we've assessed the medical aspects of this, and so um, we're comfortable with that. I will tell you that, that the... Uh, the introduction of women in submarines is not the biggest issue that I have pressing right now. And the biggest one is we ban smoking on submarines. <laughs> and so, um, the, uh, uh, and, and we think that's an overall good thing that will go into effect this year because one smokes and all breathe it in the submarine even with the oxygen scrubbing systems. And so, um, we've talked to other navies that have made this change, and that's been a significant aspect of it, is the ban smoking on there. Um, but for special accommodations, none at this point, because the first wave is primarily women on ballistic missile submarines of the officers in state rooms. And you have two or four assigned to the state rooms. Okay? So so yes. if you're not smoking submarine, where how's that gonna work? <laughs> I'm just interested They're going to get very suffering. healthy. <laughs> this is a non-smoking building, however, we have designated smoking areas. So will you have to go like yeah, to the we're, we're doing a lot of, no, they're not going to smoke. So we're doing a lot of We're going to do a lot of education, a lot of health interventions, and work with them. I mean, there'll be, you know, I assume some other strategies to deal with those that, that need to have the nicotine issue. But, that will make it easier for me. Yeah, but we're doing it on summer. <laughs> I have a question regarding submarines. Are, when they go down, they stay down, so there's no place to go. Is that correct? Oh, that's correct. Yeah. Well, I mean, the ballistic missile submarines, are they go down for three months at a period, 90 days. Most of the other submarines 
because they're nuclear powered, which is our great strategic advantage, can operate without surfacing, or and they'll have their own oxygen scrubbers and their air scrubbers in the submarine, and so um, they can operate for periods of time. I think probably until the food runs out. We got plenty of power. Um, but Captain Carter is my executive assistant. He's a submarine commanding officer, so he can answer all the technical questions. <laughs> but I can. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was just going to say that maybe we should invest in nicotine gum right away. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not a great big submarine for us. We only got 50 of them out there. So that's good. But I mean, this is a, but it, it goes to the broader point that, that, that I would ask you to think about as you that are in community leaders. We have a problem with the youth of America that is emerging in our recruiting efforts. Only about 28% of the youth of the United States are eligible to enter the military without a waiver, either for obesity or health issues, or in some of our major urban areas, up to 30% of the students are dropping out of high school. And so, um, you know, I would ask you that the health issues related uh, with the younger generation, we're seeing issues in initial entry training where we have to adjust and make sure they get proper nutrition um, and exercise regimens and those things to bring them up to the level that they can meet our performance standards. But I would ask all of you that, you know, as you've done with our veterans and care for the population that after they leave the service, whatever you can invest in youth programs, in, in technical training and education, in health, uh, they would benefit the nation as a whole, and, and we would certainly benefit from it. And I'm sure the recruiters could give you some stories about the young people, because we're in this delayed entry program of nine months while they're waiting to come in. We're doing exercise training and health training and fitness to try and get them ready for the rigors of service life. But it's, it's a national issue, I think. The Navy League continues to answer the call. Your support makes a difference to our men and women of the sea services who serve today and will serve tomorrow in support of American sea power. As one Secretary of the Navy said, the sun never sets on the Navy League.